Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this webinar organized by MENAS. For those who don't know MENAS, this is the umbrella organization from the six European radiation protection platforms, Melody, Eurodos, Euromed, Neges, Alliance, and SHARE. So basically this webinar was first to be given only in the uh, National Physics Institute of Czech Republic, then to Eurodos, but I think this is a topic which is important for the whole radiation protection community. So that's why we, we took it up one level for uh, with MENAS. So I think all scientists and everybody in Europe is quite shocked with what is happening in the Ukraine. And, um, well, not only from personal level, but also professionally, all the radiation protection experts uh, are, of course, interested in, in how the situation is in Ukraine. Uh, because Ukraine has several nuclear power plants, um, so so whatever happens there is actually of concern to the whole world. So that's why I'm, I'm very happy that um, Olena Parianyuk uh, from Ukraine is willing to give this uh, webinar. I will just shortly introduce her. So she's a senior researcher in the Institute for Safety Problems of Nuclear Power Plants of the National Academy of Science of Ukraine, and she's associate professor of uh, of national at the National University of Life and Environmental Science of Ukraine. She studied radiation biology, microbiology, sorry, focusing on the bacterial diversity of radionuclide contaminated soil of Chernobyl and Fukushima exclusion zones, as well as bacterial inhabitants of corium in the destroyed units of both uh, NPPs. So she obtained her PhD in 2013 and spent also two years as a postdoc in Japan in Fukushima University. So she's the main project researcher of several projects focusing on biodiversity of fuel containing materials and approaches to dosimetry of bacteria in the environment. So uh, Olena, the floor is yours. I just want to tell to the audience first that um, so there will be time for questions, even in there's several parts of the presentation. So we will take some time for questions. So please type the questions in the Q&A or also the public chat, but preferably the Q&A session uh, on your right in the screen. So, Lena, thanks again for willing to give this presentation and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I want to thank all of you for this great opportunity because it is very important right now for Ukraine uh, to stay online, to speak up. It is very important for us to keep everyone informed about what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, before I begin, I want to mention that uh, I'm a radiation biologist. I'm not uh, that much of uh, expert in dosimetry in the uh, using of the nuclear power plants, but everyone now in the scientific community in Ukraine are very open. So if you have some specific questions, please write it to me and I will forward it to the specialists and they will be really happy to answer the questions. Um, so... Uh, Talking about the current situation uh, in the new Ukrainian nuclear industry, I need to say that uh, there is a war on our territory and it's ongoing for already 33 days. And all of us Ukrainians, we are really grateful for all of the support from the international community, both scientific and just the global community, because without this support, uh, probably Ukraine would be inv invaded like 40 days ago. But luckily, we still can resist. So thank you very much for all of this international support. Uh, I will shortly uh, talk about the chronology of events, and then we will come to the description of everything that happened um, in a little bit another, uh, another way. So. Uh, talking about the chronology. Uh, the war in Ukraine started eight years ago, and it started when uh, Russian Federation annexed Crimea and also uh, annexed a little uh, a part of our territories in Donetsk and Lugansk regions. Uh, those regions are coal mining regions. So anyway, they annexed this part of territory and so-called uh, Donetsk and Lugansk Republic emerged on our territory. Uh, talking about the uh, situation in Ukraine, it means that uh, on March 2020, the government of those so-called republic uh, reported uh, about the flooding of the Uncom mine. 
uh, and the uh, flooding of the cleavage object. So it happened um, last year, like two years ago, and I will explain a, a little bit about this object more because probably it's the first time you're hearing about that. Then on February 24th, uh, especially uh, when the war started, Russian troops penetrated the Ukrainian border and took over the Chernobyl exclusion zone. And also uh, they took hostages as hostages, all of the uh, people who were working on the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, also who were working uh, on the spent fuel facilities, uh, the National Guard who were protecting Chernobyl power plant, and also some stalkers. Uh, on March 4th, uh, Russian troops approached from the southern part uh, of Ukraine and they attacked the Parisian nuclear power plant the nuclear power plant that was actually commercial and it was operating. On the 6th of March and now on, uh, they keep shelling the National Scientific Center of Kharkiv in the Institute of Physics. Uh, and uh, they have the natron source, uh, which is the accelerator of natrons and the accelerator of electrons. And they keep shelling it from um, till now on. On 9th of March, uh, the power line to the wet spent fuel storage facility in Chernobyl exclusion zone were cut. Uh, and that fuel storage facility uh, was left on diesel generators. Uh, on March 16, Russian troops uh, cut the third power line of the Parisia nuclear power plant. And uh, the Parisia remained uh, with only one power line. Uh, they had four previously, like four backups. And uh, on March 16, it was only one remained. And on March 31, like one week ago, Ukraine regained the control uh, over the Chernobyl exclusion zone because Russian troops were withdrawn. So no fights actually occurred in the Chernobyl exclusion zone. Um, Ukraine is a country uh, with the well-developed nuclear industry. We have quite a lot of, talking about our, our territory, we quite we have quite a lot of nuclear power plants with quite a lot of units, reactors. And uh, before uh, the annexion of Crimea and Donetsk, Donetsk and Lugansk regions, uh, it was about 50% of our electricity uh, supply from nuclear power plants. But then when uh, the, uh, those republics were taken from us, it, will, it is now about 60% of our electricity consumption that is coming from nuclear power plants. Uh, so mostly uh, we have VVR reactors and mostly we have uh, VVR 1000. Uh, also we have uh, a couple of research facilities, including Kharkiv research facility, the natron source. Also, we have the uh, research facility in Kiev uh, with a source of natrons also. Uh, we have the Uncom mine uh, in Donetsk region I was mentioning about. Uh, and also the Parisia nuclear power plant and South Ukrainian nuclear power plant. The Parisia was taken and South Ukrainian Russians Russian troops also approached South Ukrainian nuclear power plant, but we were lucky enough and our army managed to protect it. Uh, also, we have our own source of uranium. We have the most Gok uranium mines. Uh, so it is actually possible for Ukraine to supply ourselves with uranium. But uh, after uh, the Soviet Union collapse uh, and Ukraine signed the Budapest Memorandum claiming that we are uh, giving up our nuclear weapon to, uh, and we are relying on the protection from Russian Federation, Great Britain and uh, USA. Uh, so we have no facilities actually to process uranium ore, luckily. Uh, and that's why it's impossible for us to have any kind of nuclear weapons now. And we don't really want to. Um, so uh, from the smallest objects to the biggest. Uh, now we are talking about the Uncom mine. Uh, and on the screen, you can actually see where it is located. Um, uh, 
in September 1979, uh, the uranium charge of uh, 0.3 kilotons of uh, two meter, uh, of the TNT equivalent was explo exploded on the coal mine in Donetsk. So it was done uh, in order to prevent the leakage of the natural gas that was ongoing in the coal mine. The depth of this object, uh, as you can see on the picture, is about one kilometer below the ground. And it was decided that they will blow up the bomb. Uh, the technology was very innovative uh, and the, uh, uh, the class uh, container uh, will stay within uh, those coal horizons, blocking the natural gas to leak. And that's how they were going to uh, protect the population uh, on the surface uh, of Donetsk Oblast um, from um, any kind of contamination from the natural gas. Uh, the calculations were done correctly. Uh, the explosion actually happened. Uh, and uh, uh, everything was fine uh, until the annexion of those territories. So there is some uh, radionuclide contaminated water inside uh, of this glass shell. And also there are some groundwater outside of those uh, glass shell. So uh, from 1979, there were some pumps on the surface working uh, actually uh, uh, using some electricity from the grid, and they were taking uh, the groundwater out uh, from this glass container containing some um, fission products. Uh, so until 2018, it was fine. Uh, there were a couple of uh, experts who were taking care of the radiation environment, and that's it. But in 2018, the government of Donetsk decided to cut the electricity from the pumps uh, that were pumping the water out. So uh, immediately the groundwater started interacting with the glass shell and probably there are some cracks and probably there is some leakage uh, of fission products uh, from inside the glass shell to the groundwater. And it was only in August 2020 uh, when Ukrainian ecologists detected uh, about 20 to 34 uh, Ukrainian ecologists detected uh, the cesium contamination of the groundwater. Uh, those water samples were taken like five kilometer away from Yuncom. And uh, they calculated and they estimated the actually contamination uh, of Klivash, uh, of the groundwater near Klivash objects was about 20 to 34 kilobacarels per liter. Uh, unfortunately, uh, neither OSCE, no Ukrainian forces, no Ukrainian scientists have the access uh, to that territory. So we basically don't know whether or not the groundwater in Donetsk can save and whether, whether or not people are actually drinking radio, radioactive water or not. Um, and that is all for Clivage. So if someone has some questions, I will be happy and try to answer the questions. I don't see any questions yet. So maybe we can continue. And if we get questions afterwards on this, I will uh, uh, explain them. OK, so uh, our next point is the natron source. It is the research facility in Kharkiv in the Institute of Physics and Technology. So you can see where it is located. Kharkiv is located a couple of kilometers away from Ukrainian, from the border between Ukraine and Russia. Uh, so and initially, Kharkiv was believed to be so-called pro-Russian city. Uh, so, uh, dear colleagues, could you please write the questions in the public chat and then Philip will help me in managing the questions because I have two questions already. So maybe we can just write it in the public uh, part of the presentation. Uh, so, uh, Initially, probably Russian troops 
thought uh, that citizens of Kharkiv will welcome them with flowers, letting them in into the city. But Kharkiv is Ukrainian city. Uh, it is the first capital of independent Ukraine. It was a capital in the beginning of 20th century. So they want to stay in Ukraine. And that is why uh, for 40 days already, uh, Russian troops keep shelling and keep bombing Kharkiv. Uh, and also some bombs might appear on the territory of the Institute of the Physics and Technology. Um, so on February 24th, uh, as the war started, the natron source was withdrawn to a deep subcritical state. It means that the source of the, uh, um, it's working, the natron source is working on the uh, electron accelerator. So they actually cut the electricity uh, supply to the electron accelerator. Uh, so right now everything is safe. Uh, it's not working, it's not operating. Uh, but of course it contains some radioactive material inside and we would hope uh, the, that the protective uh, shield uh, for those radioactive material will stay intact and uh, no leakage of the radioactive material might occur to the environment. Because as I said, uh, it is located in Kharkiv. Kharkiv is a really big city. It's one of the biggest Ukrainian cities and we are hoping uh, that we won't have to evacuate this city. So on 6th of March, uh, the shelling of Kharkiv Institute of Physics and Technology, the natron source uh, actually occurred and the building and the facility uh, was broken. So you can see on the picture, uh, the results of the shelling on 6th of March. Uh, the situation uh, is quite difficult because uh, people who are working there in that research facility, they're trying to take care of the building and all of, uh, and on the facility, but uh, it is very difficult because of the constant air raid sirens. So sometimes it may take like two or three days actually to check the facility because it's impossible to go out uh, from the uh, shelter. So on 10th of March, the power lines uh, to the natron source were destroyed. Uh, on March 26, uh, the unexploded uh, ordnance of the uh, SMERCH multiple rocket launcher was detected on the territory of the natron source facility. So as I mentioned, we don't actually know when it appeared on that territory, but it was detected when people were able to go out from their shelters. Uh, so again, we have some uh, spot for questions, if any. Still no. nothing. Okay, so we can continue. Uh, yeah, so now we are approaching something that is really big. We are we will be talking about the Parisian nuclear nuclear power plant. So the Parisian nuclear power plant is uh, uh, is the biggest nuclear power plant is Europe in Europe, and it is commercial. It was operating uh, in February this year due to severe pressure from Russia, uh, our government decided, well, it, it was in January, in January. So our government decided to stop, actually, we were trying to stop buying uh, the um, gas and coal and oil from Russian Federation. And that was the moment when all six units of the Parisian nuclear power plant was working. So it was the very first time in the history of the Parisian nuclear power plant. And uh, yeah, so as you can see, uh, it has six units and the Parisian nuclear power plant is located in Energodar. Energodar is a city satellite. It was founded in 1970 and the population is quite big for Ukraine. It is like 52,000 and it is important. Uh, you will see uh, later why it is important. So when Russian troops approached uh, the Parisian nuclear power plant, all of the citizens of Energodar were trying to resist uh, the approach. So you can see here, we have right now uh, on the entrance to our cities, we have block posts. So uh, it's like a fortress. So you're approaching to that block post, you have to turn the lights off, you have to open your window, you have to, ha uh, to have your documents ready. 
and uh, I have a small child, so I'm usually driving with my son. So it's it works as a best document for me. But anyway, uh, there are a lot of blog posts, and also th there was a blog post uh, in Energodar, and we have the territorial defense units. Uh, they are not army. Uh, but they are local people who want to defend their territory and they have the weapons, they have the uh, armor and all of the ammunition, but it's not that much of them, of course. So uh, on the 3rd of March, when Russian, Russians approach, the citizens who mostly speak Russian, uh, they came to the terri to to the black to the blog post meeting uh russian soldiers and trying to explain them that you know it's actually a nuclear power plant it's actually the biggest nuclear power plant in in europe and if something will happen with the nuclear power plant here it will affect not only ukraine it will also contaminate russia it will also contaminate european territory in european countries so there were a lot of negotiations, probably for two days, the ne negotiations between people, normal, like regular citizens and the uh, Russian army was ongoing, but all in all, they br broke uh, through uh, the blog post and they entered Nergadar. So on March, uh, on March, the Russian troops uh, surrounded the Zaporizhian nuclear power plant and Energodar. And uh, on March 4th, at night, invaders proceed and attacked the nuclear power plant. They actually attacked the perimeter. Uh, in the very beginning, they were just staying there, uh, demanding the National Guard, who is protecting uh, our nuclear power plants, to let them in. Uh, all in all, uh, National, National Guard refused, so they decided, Russian troops decided uh, to shoot at the training center, and probably those of you who were watching uh, Director General of the EAEA explanation, uh, you saw that the training center is uh, not, well, it's not very close uh, to the working units, uh so the tank entered the territory of the parisian nuclear power plant and they started uh launching uh, the well they started shooting from tanks on the building of uh the first unit of the, the parisian nuclear power plant and also the dry uh, spent fuel storage was hit so the parisia is the only nuclear power plant in ukraine that uh has actually the storage of its own spent fuel. Um, all of the rest of the power plants uh, are storing the fuel uh, in Chernobyl exclusion zone. So uh, it is very important, important to remember that people who are working on nuclear power plant, they have the safety culture in their blood. And it's, I think that it's, um, uh, baseline for their uh, thoughts about the world. So uh, finally they stopped resisting and uh, Russian troops took the Parisian nuclear power plant. And we will watch some video now. В результаті обстрілів пожежа на атомній електростанції. Повторюю, в результаті обстрілів військами Російської Федерації в бік Запорізької АЕС виникла пожежа. Увага! Техніка Російської Федерації веде вогонь по Запорізькій атомній електростанції. Існує реальна загроза ядерної небезпеки на найбільшій атомній електростанції Європи. 
вимагаємо припинити вогонь з тяжкої техніки по енергоблокам Запорізької АЕС. Повторюю, припинити вогонь з тяжкої техніки по Запорізькій АЕС. Uh, thank you very much. So all in all, it was the illumination missile and it caused severe fire on the territory of the training center, but no leakage of uh, radioactive material, luckily. And also uh, the spent fuel, uh, the spent fuel facility was hit. Uh, the buildings were corrupted, but no leakage of the radionuclides in the environment, as far as we know. And the second video now. The next slide, please. So yeah, uh, those uh, that was a video of people in Anargadar. Uh, people in Anargadar, relatives of the operators of the nuclear power plant, they didn't want uh, to be under Russian occupation, and they don't. They want to be. They want to stay in Ukraine. They want to stay Ukrainians. They are Ukrainians. So uh, there are a lot of constant demonstrations almost every day. I can see it in use in the Telegram channel of the Energoatom, uh, who is the operator of our nuclear power plants. So uh, they keep going to the dem demonstrations. They're just civilians and Russian troops keep shooting at people. Uh, there, are, there is some information that actually uh, civilians, some of civilians were killed during all of those demonstrations. So uh, talking about the current situation of the nuclear power plant, and I'm showing here just the information that was recognized by the EAA because, of course, we have a lot of rumors and uh, we have a lot of concerns that are circulating in our media in Ukraine. But still, the situation is that on 6th of March, uh, the regular staff continued to operate uh, the Parisian nuclear power plant. But the plant management uh, is now under the orders uh, from commander of Russian forces controlling site. Uh, Ukraine's nuclear regulator tells the AIA uh, it is having problems in communicating with staff operating the Parisian nuclear power plant. So basically, uh, in the beginning of March, uh, the operators were uh, taking care of the Parisian uh, under the constant psychological pressure. So it was possible uh, for the Parisian uh, to turn off uh four reactors so uh, the uh, the first unit uh, when russian troops approach the first Okay, we seem to have lost connection, so just have a few seconds. Olena was um, presenting from Ukraine and she told us in advance that she might have problems with uh, unstable internet, but she has different accounts, so she will uh, try to leave and join again. So please have a few seconds of patience. Okay, I read that she's reconnecting, so she will be there in some seconds. So we see that she is trying to reconnect.
I also see that in the meantime, there's quite some questions already in the chat. So we hope to have the time with Olena to, to answer all of them. Yeah, some questions. Um, Olena was really presenting. She's in the Ukraine at the moment. She's west of Kiev and she was presenting from there. And she's trying now with a different internet connection. on the 1st of March, uh, the staff had not been informed beforehand. Sorry, so Elena, is... Elena, sorry. Yep. Um, we see you back, but you, you were lost for uh, two, three minutes. So oh. I don't know what exactly, but I think you were just explaining this slide on the yeah, problem. Yeah, sorry. But you're back now, so that's good. So please continue. Uh, OK, so uh i was uh, just saying about the rosatom have, uh, you probably haven't heard so i will just come back to it uh we are talking right now on, on this uh, about the situation that occurred on 12th of march when uh, 15 persons uh, from rosatom arrived uh, to the parisian pp site uh so uh, initially the plans was that those people will take over the control on the parisian nuclear power plant but luckily, during the independence in Ukraine, we managed to uh, make some amendments uh, in the design of the nuclear power plant and also in the design of the safety measures uh, on the nuclear power plant. So probably that is why it was impos impossible for Russians to operate our nuclear power plant. And that is why um, it remains under control uh, from... it. It remains under operation of Ukrainian uh, specialists, but under control from Russian people. Uh, on 15th of March, uh, staff at the Parisian NPP confirmed the reports that the Russian military uh, has detonated the unexploded bombs uh, left on the site after uh, they took over the Parisian PP and uh, they were actually detonating uh, it inside the perimeter uh, and the staff got the warning like uh, 30 seconds before the detonation. So it was quite a big deal here. Um, uh, staff didn't know what was going on because they were sitting in the control room since the Parisian nuclear power plant, but it was just maintained for Russians. Uh, so on 16th of March, uh, the Parisian nuclear power plant, as I mentioned before, lost connect connection uh, to the third power line. So it remained, uh, it was like a couple of hours when only one power line was operational. Uh, and that uh, was, uh, that caused the decision from uh, Energoatom to decrease the capacity of two working units. Uh, so, uh, as for now, there are two units and they are working on 50% of the capacity. Uh, but as far as I know, uh, the second line uh, was renewed uh, by Ukrainian specialists. And uh, right now, it's um, we can say that it is safer than it was when uh, Zaporizhia was connected only to uh, one power line. And also, uh, it is very. Can can you see me? So also, it is very important to realize that uh, when we are talking about Chernobyl, for example, the reason for Chernobyl accident was a lack of safety culture and a huge psychological pressure of the operating staff of Chernobyl nuclear power plant. So right now, the Parisia staff 
is under huge psychological pressure because they have families and those families are living in Energodar and it's not safe in Energodar now. So probably uh, it is quite difficult to concentrate on operating the nuclear power plant when you have to think uh, whether or not your wife and your kids are safe. So that is why uh, Ukraine keeps demanding uh, from Russian Federation and uh, we are asking international community to support us in this demand. We think and we are demanding that the Parisian nuclear power plant and Energodar should be left uh, by Russian forces and uh, uh, Energatom uh, should have the full right uh, and, and full access to the operation of the Parisian nuclear power plant because we just don't want another nuclear accident on the territory of our country. And also, <laughs> I need to mention uh, that um, if some kind of accident will occur in the Parisia, uh, most likely Ukraine won't be able to take care of the consequences because right now we are fighting for our tomorrow and uh, the Parisia is under occupation by, by Russians. It means that even the firefighters probably won't be able to reach the Parisian nuclear power plant. That is why it is very important to get rid of Russians on the territory of the Parisian nuclear power plant if we want to maintain uh, the radiation safety of the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, so that is it for Zaporizhia. And if someone has some questions, I will try to answer. Yes, in the meantime, there's many, many questions. So <laughs> even <laughs> some on the first part and for gen a few general ones. So let me start by uh, a few questions on Zaporizhia itself. So I see one question, uh, if the six reactor blocks have concrete security containment protection um, for... Yes, they do. Uh, in, uh, in 2000, in year 2000, the Parisia was recognized as the safest nuclear power plant in Europe. One of the safest, one of three safest nuclear power plant in Europe. So yes, it does, the, it have the containment. And do you know if the population around the nuclear power plants have iodine tablets available? Uh, they probably do because it is Energodar and they are uh, the city satellite for the nuclear power plant. So I think they do have the iodine tablets. Mm -hmm. Another question, was the simulator destroyed in training school there? Uh, yeah, it was destroyed. It was a training center. It was hit by the elimination missile. So it was completely destroyed and uh, I mean... We have the grief about it because it was the place where all of the apparatus of our nuclear power plants were actually training. Okay. How many of the reactors were actually working on March the 4th in, in Zaporizhia? Uh, five of them. They were actually, well, um, on February 24th, five reactors were working. But then uh, the staff started to power off the reactors because, because it was more or less obvious that Russians will try to take over the nuclear power plant. So I won't be able actually to answer these questions, uh, this question about the 4th of March, but the staff was aware that something might happen. So they were trying to decrease uh, the operating capacity. Okay. Is it now a normal staff rotation in the NPP at the moment? Do you know this? Uh, it depends. So like every day I'm reading news in Energatom Telegram channel. So sometimes it's normal, sometimes it's not, sometimes they have a delays. So it's not, I mean, it's not completely normal, but they manage to have the rotation. Okay. Was there any damage to the spent fuel in the dry storage there? Uh, as far as we know, uh, no damage, but uh, we have no information yet. I mean, at least no radiation leaks for sure. Okay. Um, what is the current thermal or electrical power of each of the units? And has any of the safety portable equipment been damaged? And is the third electric offsite network lost in March 16th successfully reconnected to the NPP? So it's several questions there. Uh, the line was successfully reconnected. So right now it relies on two power lines. But I'm sorry, I don't know the answers, answers on those questions. And also probably no one will tell it to you because 
uh, it's a secret information and we would prefer uh, not to share it yeah. before the victory of Ukraine. Okay. Another one, I think, on the NPP environment. So do you know if there are radioactive sensors in the area that are still operating to monitor possible release of radionuclides in the environment there? Uh, there are uh, the sensors. Uh, they are normally operating, but right now we have no connection to it. I mean, we, we cannot see the data from those sensors. But as far as I know, EIA actually can see the data from those sensors. It's just not public. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a few already on Chernobyl. Maybe I can tell you also the ones that are on Yunkom. So one question, what about the present level of contamination in the vicinity of Yunkom mine? So at the moment, is there anything known about this? It's a acute phase of attack right now over there. And actually, <laughs> People, scientists and ecologists and specialists are not allowed to go there. And on the contrary, people are trying to evacuate from there because we are expecting another attack quite soon on that territory, exactly. So we don't know anything, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And who is usually responsible of monitoring groundwater quality around the, the mine? Uh, the Ministry of Environmental Protection. Uh, um, uh, the Ministry of Environmental Protection of Ukraine is responsible on controlling the quality of the groundwater in Ukraine, but the mine is not under the control of Ukraine right now. So I don't know who is responsible mm -hmm. there. Okay. Uh, one more on the neutron source. So what are the impacts of cutting of the power for this neutron source, environmentally wise speaking? Uh, well, it won't be, uh, scientists won't be able to turn it on again. So it's just under critical right now, and uh, there is no possibility to, to turn the natron source on. Um, that is, I think that is good. Okay. Now I'm um, looking at the chat because there are also some questions there. Uh, so we switch back to the to the nuclear power plant. So. What kind of damage was caused to the buildings of Unit 1 and the dry spent fuel storage? Um, I don't know, unfortunately. I mean, there are you can just Google it in the uh, internet. There are some photos, but uh, the situation is very tense and uh, operators are not allowed to use their phones freely. Uh, and so they actually prefer not to, you know, uh, not to interfere with Russians and with Russian soldiers. So probably uh, I would say that all of those information is more or less rumors and it's not reliable yet. So we have to regain the access and regain the control over Zaporizhia to actually access uh, all of the damage that was done during the attack. Okay. Um... Then considering the type of reactor and the shielding in concrete of in concrete and iron, do you think mm -hmm. a hit with a missile can reach the core? Can you say I something don't know. about it? You don't know. I, I'm sorry, uh, I don't know, but I'm quite sure that uh, the reactor was not designed to withdraw the direct hit with a missile. And I would prefer not to, you know, not to have any experiments on it. Okay. And yeah, there's some more general questions and there are also some, um, yeah, there's one still on this uh, flooded coal mine. So regarding the flooded coal mine with cesium-137 uh, being as high as 20 to 34 kilobecquerel per liter compared to the guidance level of 10 becquerel per liter in drinking water, has an assessment been made if the potential dose uh, of the potential dose to water ingestion by people and cattle? Uh, the trick is that the uh, cleavage, the object itself, so uh, Yuncom is a mine and cleavage is this, you know, glass object. So the cleavage itself is like one kilometer before the surface, uh, beneath the surface. And uh, we don't know whether or not the groundwater from beneath the surface actually uh, interfering, interfering with the groundwater horizons uh, where people are, people are taking water from. So we have the hope that the groundwater on the surface 
un directly under cleavage is not contaminating. And uh, there is this saying that for pollution, dilution is the best solution. So we have the hope that it was diluted uh, in the underground, uh, like underground groundwater and the uh, um, internal dose uh, is not elevated for a population that is living on those territories. But again, we have to regain control on those territories and we have to, you know, take samples, measure the radionuclide content and we have to confirm it. So there is unfortunately no other way, no calculations uh, can give you um, any any idea about what's going on there. Okay, thank you. So you see, there's a lot of questions. There's many more coming in. Uh, so, but I, I propose that you first continue with the, the last part. I think on Chernobyl, and mm -hmm. and then we come back with the questions on Chernobyl and some of the general questions. Okay. So thank you very much and. Uh, uh, talking about Chernobyl, so I'm actually working in Chernobyl, in, in the town of Chernobyl, and that is, uh, I can uh, answer uh, more questions about Chernobyl and about the exclusion zone as I have the, I mean, first-hand experience working there. So the very first thing that we have to understand about Chernobyl nuclear power plant, uh, and people Usually I'm talking to journalists and they seem not to make a difference between Zaporizhia and Chernobyl. So Chernobyl nuclear power plant is a state enterprise that is dedicated to take care of uh, radioactive waste. Uh, Chernobyl nuclear power plant is not operational. So it, it's not operational for 22 years already. All of the nuclear fuel uh, that remained in the units one, two and three so the first unit is uh, uh, damaged, it is destructed, and the unit one, two, and three, they were operational until the year 2000, like until 20, 22 years ago, they were supplying electricity to Kiev. Uh, and then we uh, turn it off, and there is no RBMK reactors in Ukraine anymore, because in Chernobyl, all of the reactors were RBMK. So it is located on the northern part of Ukraine, and... Uh, it is surrounded by the exclusion zone, Chernobyl exclusion zone. We have, uh, which is now Chernobyl uh, National Biospheric Reserve. I will talk about it um, later. And also there is the exclusion zone on the territory of Belarus, which means that there is a huge alienated territory. It's like a huge alienated territory uh, on the territory of Ukraine. And it also, uh, it's connected on the huge alienated territory and the territory of Belarus. So our two national reserved, uh, they are, the idea was that together they will form a huge national, national biospheric reserve and we will be able to study uh, the wildlife, the flora and fauna over there. But again, it was a huge alienated territory and uh, Russian troops, penetrated Ukrainian border, especially on the territory of the Chernobyl exclusion zone. And uh, it's usually taken me, I live in Kiev, well, right now I'm not in Kiev, but uh, usually, normally I live in Kiev, and it takes me about one hour and 20 minutes to drive from my home to Chernobyl, if there is no traffic jams. Uh, so that is why uh, for our army, it was more or less obvious that Russians might penetrate the border uh, through this spot. But the situation is that uh, Ukraine, over there, Ukraine have the border not with Russia, but with Belarus. So we still had the hope that Belarus won't let Russian soldiers in. So uh, the Chernobyl, there is no such unit as the Chernobyl exclusion zone anymore. It's just the old name. Uh, the modern name is the Chernobyl Radiation and Ecological Biosphere Reserve. And the overall territory is uh, 2,600 square kilometers, uh, quite a huge territory. Um, and uh, uh, the structure of the reserve is as follows. So in the very center of the reserve, there is so-called 10 kilometer zone, uh, which contains uh, all of the uh, nuclear 
all of the spent fuel storage, it also contains Pripyat, uh, the ghost city that was a city satellite for Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Uh, so this 10 kilometer zone, uh, it's not the reserve. Uh, it's under the control of Energoatom and under the control and the direct control of our uh, government. So this 10 kilometer zone contains the power generating units one, two and three. Uh, so they are under permanent shutdown and all of the nuclear fuel was taken from those units and it was placed uh, uh, in the wet spent fuel storage facility. Uh, 10 kilometer zone contains also the shelter and the new safe confinement. It's, you know, it's like a, a cabbage. There is a destroyed reactor and then the shelter and then the new safe confinement over there. Uh, it contains the industrial complex for solid radioactive waste management. It means that on this uh, complex, which is called Vector, uh, we are usually taking all of our sources, including medical sources, including industrial sources, and uh, all of those uh, radioactive material, which is not from Chernobyl, but also from other industries in Ukraine, it's stored uh, in this industrial complex. Uh, it has the wet spent fuel storage facility, uh, which is a huge basins uh, in the concrete uh, concrete shelling. We have the dry spent uh, fuel storage facility that was open um, like a couple of months ago and it is a great victory for Ukrainian nuclear and industry that we actually can store all of our spent fuel uh, on the territory of Ukraine because before that we have to uh, ship it to Russia and pay Russia for um, maintains of our spent fuel. Uh, there are also radioactive waste disposal points, and that is very important uh, for this talk, so please consider it. There is the radioactive waste disposal points uh, where all of the radionuclide contaminated uh, machines and uh, some of the uh, contaminated clothes and uh, the upper soil level, uh, layer, it was grabbed and then it was dug uh, on the territory of this uh, radioactive waste disposal points. So usually it's like a, a hill uh, with a sign that uh, it is highly radioactive. So please take care of it. So it's just, you know, a, um, just a place where all of this radioactive stuff uh, is dug under the ground. And there is also uh, the radioactive waste interim conf uh, confinement sites, which also includes the Red Forest. So probably some of you heard the information about the trenches in the Red Forest. Uh, so when we are talking about the Red Forest, we are talking about the, um, uh, the trees, uh, and the upper soil level, level that all of it was cut and then it was buried uh, in the trenches and then one meter uh, of the pure sand was uh, placed on the on the top of it and then some trees were uh, planted on this sand to prevent the erosion, the wind erosion of that territory. So when we are talking about the red forest, we are talking about the radioactive waste interim confinement sites. And also all of the rest of the territory of Chernobyl Ecological Reserve, it is a protected area, it has a unique flora and fauna, and they used to have quite a lot of international programs on uh, monitoring of the wildlife and saving of the wildlife, and also there is a... Um, uh, due to the climate change, uh, the flora and fauna uh, in Chernobyl Exclusion Zone, in I'm sorry, in the biological, in the Chernobyl reserve is changing. So it is very interesting and it is very important actually to watch all of those changes. And uh, talking about the state enterprise Chernobyl nuclear power plant, uh, as I said, it is the enterprise for the decommissioning of the nuclear power units and the transformation of the shelter into the environmentally safe system, which means that uh, this new arch that was mounted uh, on the, it was mounted over their uh, old shelter object. Um, it was designed to contain 
the radioactive dust inside for 100 years and we are go during the next 100 years we were going to uh, the Chernobyl nuclear power plant was going for decommissioning and we were going actually to dismantle uh, all of the shelter object under the arch and we were going to uh, make it completely completely safe, environmentally safe. So it was designed, uh, it is, uh, it consists from of two cladings, the external cladding and the internal cladding, and uh, it can withdraw uh, a lot of impacts, including tornado, because uh, here in Ukraine, we don't have any floods, any earthquakes, nothing. We have, we have the danger of tornadoes. Uh, it is, of course, air and waterproof. It is hermetic. It should last for 100 of years, even without maintains. Uh, it can withstand fire because we have a lot of forest fires uh, on that territory. And uh, it should have withstanded the impact loads, uh, for example, snow or, for example, like an accident hit of um, some kind of rocks or something like this. But no one ever calculated what will happen if the missile will hit the, this arch. And the most important and the most interesting is for me is the contents of the destroyed unit. So it has uh, three not, uh, 1,300 tons of the fuel containing masses, which means that uh, when the uh, nuclear power plant, when the reactor exploded, uh, the temperature in the reactor was very high. And all of these fuel rods, they were melting. They were the um, iron cladding and the baton and the concrete, it was melting together with it. And right now we have this uh, fuel containing materials, uh, which is basically like a, a lava that was cooled down. Uh, and though, though that lava, it melted through uh, the biological shielding of the reactor and it melted to the uh, um, lower rooms uh, that are located under the, the reactor. So in the very beginning, in 1990s, it was a glass-like structure. So it was impossible to take any samples from there. So I'm working with the samples of those radioactive lava. And uh, in the beginning of 1990s, 90s, uh, my colleagues were... Uh, asking a sniper to shoot with the with the bullet those radioactive lava and it was possible actually to pick some tiny parts of these fuel containing materials but as for now uh, the corrosion the chemical and biological corrosion uh, of that territory is ongoing uh, and there are a lot of radioactive dust over there and those fuel containing uh, masses they're not uh, that solid anymore. Uh, so there is a lot of radioactive dust uh, from that fuel containing masses and that radioactive dust of course contains the decay products, the uranium decay products and also it has some plutonium, some americium and stuff. And also there are four tons of the radioactive dust and this dust is very, uh, well, it's very dispersed and it's uh, the, the particles are tiny. So in case if something will happen, all of this dust will just go out and uh, it might contaminate the air and then it might uh, create the cloud, the radioactive cloud, and it, it will depend on the wind, uh, the direction of the distribution of this wind. Uh, also, uh, my colleagues, uh, calculated, they created the model and they provided the calculations that uh, there is some uh, increase in the natron flux uh, in th inside the sarcophagus. So before uh, the installation of the new safe confinement, there were a lot of, lot of water. So uh, the shelter object contained a lot of cracks. Uh, so the atmospheric water was just penetrating uh, the um, sarcophagus and uh, the air inside the sarcophagus was quite, quite uh, well, wet, misty, um, and the natron flux was more or less stable. But 
after the installation uh, of the new arch, there is no water access anymore. So the air is dry and the natron flux started to uh, increase. And our institute is uh, uh, asking for international support and international help as we need actually to calculate the scenario uh, of those nat natron flux and what's, what's going on actually inside the sarcophagus. Um, in accordance with my colleague's calculation, uh, everything is fine with the natron flux. So since the beginning uh, of uh, the war, uh, even before the beginning of the war, a couple of months before that, there is a plateau uh, in the level of the natrons inside the sarcophagus. So everything is safe as for now. But anyway, uh, that is a question that should be studied. And uh, Chernobyl nuclear power plant is very open. The, the, this facility, they are supporting the um, Ukrainian research and they're also supporting the international research. So if it is interesting for any of you, we are very uh, open and we are very welcoming you and we will be really grateful for your help uh, in the solving of this mystery uh, of Chernobyl sarcophagus. So uh, that is why uh, we got so scared when uh, I saw this video. So Kirsten, could you please play it? Sorry. Uh, so uh, it is just a very short video uh, that was taken uh, by the staff of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. And you could see uh, the remains of the fifth and sixth unit. Uh, they were the, the construction of those units were canceled of the Chernobyl uh, accident. Uh, so the tanks just penetrated the perimeter of Chernobyl nuclear power plant and they seized the control on the station. So uh, I'm sorry, that is a mistake. So 211 persons, not 2000, just 211 persons were taken hostages uh, in, inside the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Uh, and uh, it is uh, important to understand again that they are not operators. They are just taking care of the maintenance of the new safe confinement. They were taking care of the maintenance of the spent fuel storage facilities. And also uh, there, there is a contingent of the National Guard that was protecting Chernobyl nuclear power plant. I I'm sorry, it's the Syrian, so it's, it might be a little bit loud. Uh, so they were just taken hostages and uh, no rotation occurred. The regular shift in Chernobyl nuclear power plant is 12 hours, but people who were uh, working there all in all, they spent 600 hours working in Chernobyl. So on March 14, um, the specialists who are working there, you know, they are very strong and they are very patriotic and they are, uh, they prefer to take care of Chernobyl nuclear power plant, but they just informed that uh, due to the moral, physical and physiological exhaustion, uh, the staff wasn't able to continue maintenance works because they have no actual access to a normal food. They have food, they had food. But it was not diverse, I would say, because it was some kind of storages, like the uh, the uh, some food that was stored for a case of accident. So you can see that you can imagine that like no fresh vegetables, no no fresh apples, something like that. Uh, nothing of that was there. They didn't have any access to medication. So normally, people who are working in Chernobyl, they are very healthy. Uh, but uh, you have some kind of, you know, emotional pressure when you're under Russian occupation. And also uh, all of the uh, Russians, Russian soldiers took all of the um, uh, cell phones from those people. So there were no connection almost at all uh, with the staff. And then the head of the shift managed to negotiate with Russians and then using their, uh, the uh, the regular the wire phone, uh, they were contacting uh, the energy atom once per per day, 
and uh, of course some russian soldier or like russian troops were always present in the room uh during the call so it was impossible actually to deliver any information oh it was possible to deliver some information but not as much and then again the staff managed to negotiate with people with the russians um and Russians were not interfering in the regular work and in the regular maintenance work uh, that was ongoing there because they were not actually understanding what's going on there. So on March 20, the staff, the partial staff rotation uh, finally happened. So uh, 64 persons out of uh, 211 were taken out of exclusion zone. Uh, and uh, mostly all of the rest of people decided to stay there because they didn't want to pose a danger to people who would come to, to exchange them. And on March 31, uh, the Chernobyl nuclear power plant um, returned back under control of uh, Ukraine. And the National Guards uh, who were taking care of Chernobyl, they were taking hostages and they were probably taken to the territory of Belarus. And we know nothing, unfortunately, about about their destiny and where are they now and what's going on with them. Um, there is the, they used to be the automated remote radiation monitoring system. It contained like 84 uh, automated monitors and it was uh, possible to access the information online. So this picture is a picture from the book on radiation monitor monitoring that I was writing before the war. And uh, so it was possible actually to access the information. They were renewing the information in a normal uh, situation every two hours. And uh, in the accidental situation, they should have renewed the information every two minutes. But uh, the penetration and the occupation happened so fast that no one was actually able to switch uh, the system on this accidental mode. And uh, people who are work, including my colleagues from the Institute of Safety Problems, they were evacuated at 7 a.m. and they were actually hearing the explosions that were happening in Chernobyl nuclear power plant. So the latest data uh, we had from our uh, remote radiation monitoring system was as follows. You can see it on the picture. So uh, some of the uh, monitors show the uh, elevation, like two or three times the elevation that might be caused uh, by the elevation of dust uh, due to the heavy machinery, Russian heavy machinery. But we have a lot of doubts and questions about the point six. You can see it on the very bottom of the table. So it says vector and the elevation of the dose rate is like seven times. And a vector is the uh, storage uh, is a facility to store uh, the radiation radiation waste that I mentioned before. So we don't actually know what happened there. And uh, right now there are some missions that are already in the exclusion zone. So uh, within a couple of days, we will have some information, some updated information about the situation in our spent nuclear fuel storage facilities. So yeah, yeah. The I wanted to say that the system is down, and I just like a, forty minutes ago I saw photos that the Russians uh, stole all of the computer equipment from this radiation monitoring system, and we haven't checked uh, the monitors yet, but probably they were also looted. Uh, as I mentioned, there was a situation with the. Uh, with the electricity shut down and the power line shut down on the 9th of March, there was a lot of concerns from Ukrainian side because no one wants uh, the contamination from Chernobyl to come again. So for two days, uh, spent fuel, wet spent fuel storage facility was out of the grid. And then uh, Ukrainian workers managed to uh, to repair the power line. So right now everything is fine and the pumps uh, that are taking care of the water 
rotation in that inside the wet span fuel storage facility they are operating normally and we are not expecting any problems uh, and any leakage of the radioactivity any increase of the temperature uh, of the water in those basins uh, there are some laboratories, unique laboratories in the uh, Chernobyl town. In, um, so uh, on the picture, you can see the laboratories of the uh, Special Enterprise Eco Center. And uh, they had really unique experience of uh, measuring all kinds of radioactivity, measuring all of the specters and stuff. So you can see on the picture uh, some of the students who were studying spectrometry in Chernobyl in the Eco Center. And then the second picture, you can see Eco Center as it looks like now. As far as we know, um, Russians just looted all of the computer equipment and we have uh, like rumors that they ruined uh, the measurement equipment and then they, they they just broke down the spectrometers but as you can see in, on, on those pictures spectrometers uh, the spectrometers itself are more or less fine so we still have the hope that we have the equipment left there but no computers and no servers of course uh the forest fires so um on the picture you can see um uh, from uh fire rms system you can see um the amount of forest fires on the territory of chernobyl and please uh, consider that it is uh, the situation uh for like one month uh, from the from the middle of march to the middle of april uh it's very important to understand that uh Usually, there are forest fires in the exclusion zone during the springtime, but of course, our firefighters are able usually to get there and to take care of the fire. There were huge forest fires in April 2015, in April 2020. Uh, so um, my colleagues from my institute calculated the release of cesium-137 from the forest fire this time, forest fires these times, and it um, seems like everything was fine. So no drastical increase of the cesium content, uh, content in the air as for now. Uh, luckily, we have this joke here that even Ukrainian nature uh, is helping Ukrainians in this war. So luckily, uh, the rain like the rain season, the spring rain season started in Ukraine. So all of those forest fires, they were uh, put down basically by the rain. So as far as we know, right now, there are no forest fires, but anyway, uh, even if some kind of forest fires will start, our five fighters won't be able to get uh, to the places of the forest fires because there are a lot of mines in the forests of Chernobyl, and uh, right, and uh, our miners, the the people who should take care of mines, they are not working in the exclusion zone because also there are huge territories of the populated areas that are also mined. So first of all, uh, people will take care of the populated areas and probably after that, within a couple of months, I hope they will take care of the exclusion zone. And uh, the trenches in the Red Forest, um, it's like a really heated discussion uh, within the radiation professionals here in Ukraine that we actually have this uh, place of local localization of the radioactive biomass in the Red Forest. And it is located like less than one kilometer uh, away from the destroyed nuclear reactor. So um, during the accident back at 1986, uh, a huge amount of radioactivity fell down on the territory of that forest. Then the forest was cut down and it was buried into the trenches and then some uh, new vegetation emerged on those territories. So when we are talking about the uh, trenches uh, in the Red Forest, we are usually thinking that Russians might dig the trenches on the exact place of the burials of, of the radioactive waste. So as for now, there are some trenches and I will show you uh, the video on the next slide, but probably uh, 
it is not located on the on those burial sites. We hope that they are not. I mean, they decided not to dig the drench, trenches on that territory. Uh, so uh, there was some information. I'm not sure that it is correct, but it's uh, rumors that there are some people with a radiation, acute radiation sickness uh, on the territory of Belarus. Uh, and there, there was also the rumor that one person died from acute radiation sickness. But the reality is that if they were not digging the trenches uh, on the burial sites, uh, it is impossible to get the dose to get the acute radiation sickness. So if the information about the acute radiation sickness is correct, we need to check our radioactive waste storages to be sure that uh, they remained intact. So the video now about the trenches. Чуєте, от зараз виміряємо радіаційний фон, він уже пишіть, показує перевищення. От місце, де російські військовослужбовці в забрудненій території рили окопи, от, ну, як видно, для людей, от для важкої техніки, для, для танків або інших важких машин. Дуже багато риби. Дуже багато, багато їх залишків від їжі. Вони тут і жили в цьому лісі. І багато поспалювали. Uh, so, uh, again, I will be grateful for your support uh, to be able to calculate the dose correctly uh, because I, it is my opinion, my personal opinion, that I don't believe that it was possible to get the dose to get the acute radiation sickness in those trenches. And uh, now I'm taking my chance and uh, I will tell a little bit about the key development directions. And I think that it is the opportunity for the Chernobyl exclusion zone to create some new, uh, some new infrastructure. So it's like uh, we will start from the very beginning. It is quite obvious that because of the uh, dust lift from the heavy um, war machinery, uh, there is a lot, a lot of the contamination, the structure of contamination of the exclusion zone changed. So that is why we need a new plan for a radiation monitoring system for future. And we would be grateful for international support here to be able to create this new monitoring system looking in the future, like, Five, uh, 50 or 100 years in advance to be able actually to monitor and to use uh, all of the experience that we have uh, and that we learned from Fukushima accident and also from this uh, invasion. Uh, we would be grateful and again Chernobyl nuclear power plant and our institute and Chernobyl radiation biological reserve are very open for cooperation and we really need to help in mapping creating the new maps of the exclusion zone and we need to focus on the remote approaches to the mapping because as I said the forests are mined and uh, probably we will have to know uh, the situation before uh, our soldiers will go into those forests to take care of the mines. Uh, we need to study the fuel containing masses inside the force unit of the nuclear power plant. Uh, power plant uh, and I th also think that the remote approaches are very uh, important. So my institute was cooperating with, the, um, with Bristol Institute uh, in order to map the situation and map the natron flux uh, inside the sarcophagus which is also very important for nuclear safety of uh, that facility uh, again we need to estimate the natron flux and we need to create the scenarios uh, how did it happen that the natron flux increased and of course uh, it's possible to use the exclusion zone for the development of the alternative generation 
uh, including the small modul modular reactors and also including some kind of uh, sun energy, wind energy, and etc. And uh, making uh, conclusions uh, on the press conference on March 7th, uh, the Director General, General of the EAEA outlined the seven pillars of the nuclear safety. And during my presentation, uh, we saw that six pillars uh, of this nuclear safety are already broken uh, by Russian troops. So all the safety and security systems and equipment must be fully functional at all times. And you uh, saw the information that EAEA lost uh, control over the Parisian nuclear power plant at least for a couple of days. The operating staff must be able to fulfill their safety and security duties without any pressure. And I stressed that both in Chernobyl and the Parisia people are under constant pressure. Not in Chernobyl anymore, but in Sparisia, it's indeed. Um, there must be secure power, uh, off-site power supplied from the grid for all nuclear sites. And uh, there is no secure power supplied for the Sparisia right now. There must be uh, unintended logistical supply chains and transportation to and from the sites. And as I mentioned, uh, there is no supply chain for the Parisian nuclear power plant right now. There must be the effective on-site and off-site radiation monitoring systems. And uh, we have no radiation monitoring system in, in Chernobyl anymore. Uh, there must be reliable communication with the regulator and others. And there is no reliable communication with the EIA from the Parisian nuclear power plant. The only uh, pillar that remained more or less intact is the physical integrity of the facilities should be intact. But again, uh, talking about those trenches and the death from acute radiation syndrome, we don't know whether or not the spent nuclear fuel facilities remained intact. We hope it did, but we don't know it yet. And here, I'm so grateful for your attention and I'm welcoming you after the victory of Ukraine, of course, I'm welcoming you to Ukraine. And uh, I will be grateful for all of the international support to the development of Chernobyl exclusion zone and probably the safety culture uh, all over the world. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very, very much. So very interesting, very good talk. Um, we're 20 minutes behind schedule, but I understand we're still more than 400 people online, so everybody's staying because it's interesting. And there's still uh, quite a lot of questions, more than, I think, about 30 questions still open. I, I will select a few if, if you still have some time, Alina, to, to try to answer them. Yeah, I will be happy to answer. Yeah. And then, again, so if, I won't be able to, if I won't be able to answer, right. please uh, write me, uh, please write me the email. I will be happy to contact you with people who can answer those questions. Yeah, sure. Let's let's continue another five to ten minutes with a few questions. Then, um, so there's one question from Jordi: uh, What what do you regard what do you regard as top priority for Ukraine in terms of international support? Uh, you you gave one slide which things you need in the in, in the future, but but what about uh, immediate support? What what are the priorities now? Well, we need weapons. Uh, we need the weapons. Yeah. And We're we an international also... scientific community. <laughs> How can we yeah, help? Yeah. Uh, from the international, um, I mean, right now uh, it is very important to form, I think it's my personal idea, so I think that it is very important to form some kind of uh, council unit or some kind of commission uh, to create a plan for a radiation monitoring system inside the Chernobyl exclusion zone and also to access the radiation monitoring in the Parisian nuclear power plant. So monitoring and the new approaches to the monitoring is very important for us and like creating this kind of support unit that can give us the advice about the modern approaches to the monitoring and uh, to the uh, remote monitoring. There's also a question about um, Pascal, who saw some reports that Russian soldiers have been uh, treated in Gomel in Belarus, uh, who allegedly were contaminated in Chernobyl. Do you know about this, or do you have seen such reports? Or 
Uh, yeah, I've seen su such reports, and it's again those rumors about the uh, acute radiation sickness in Gomel. I don't. I mean, I have seen no documents, nothing official, of course. So I would treat them just as rumors, because in case it is true, we will have to find the source of the uh, radiation contamination of those people. So I mean, it. It's not I, in accordance with my calculations that were supported by Andre's calculations and his colleagues' calculations, seems like it is impossible to get the acute radiation syndrome from just uh, trenches in the Red Forest. So we will have to find the source um, of the, that acute radiation syndrome. Okay. Um... For, for both Chernobyl and, and the other power plants, are there missing supplies to ensure safety? Are, are there not sufficient stocks of diesel, boron, etc.? Uh, I won't share this information, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay, sure. Um, there's also one question from Rodolfo, maybe not to be answered, but I, I think that it, this, that it would be good to be in contact with him afterwards. He's from Rodolfo Cusuarez from the IEA. Uh, what um, for the international assistance? Um, what specific technical needs are needed? So maybe that's also something to take into account for later. And um, yeah, maybe another one here is on. So the, the acute radiation effects, which maybe have happened, could it be from some radioactive sources that uh, unwittingly got looted? Or, is, yeah, is that it possible. Could. Or yeah, yeah, that that is possible. And uh, yet we don't know, I mean, we still have to um, uh, to make the list of all, we have the list of all our sources from before, and now we have to, to make the list and it's, you know, it's an ongoing work. And once scientists will be allowed to go to the exclusion zone, which we are not allowed now. Well, we are strongly, uh, strongly advised not to go there yet. So as soon as we will be able to go there, we will make a register of the sources and we will see. Yeah. And and the, perso the personnel at Chernobyl, have they been replaced in the meantime now that the Russians have withdrawn or you know this? Um, so the staff operating? <laughs> it is a complicated question because uh, could we please turn on the presentation for a moment? I just... Uh, it's the question of, um, yeah, uh, it's a question of communication. Um, ah, here. Uh, so as you can see, oh, sorry. Well, as you can see on the northern part of Ukraine, uh, there is a kind of, you know, gap in our border. So Slavutich uh, is the, the new city satellite that is uh, out of the territory of Chernobyl. Uh, so Slav uh, it is actually impossible. There is no direct connection between Slavutich and Chernobyl. So people have to take the train and the train is commuted. Uh, the train line is on the, ter the rail railway is uh, a part of the railway is on the territory of Belarus. Uh, so normally we have a good neighbor, we used to have a good neighbor relationships with Belarus, and it was fine, people were just commuting, they had like a special permissions to penetrate, to, to you know, to, to cross the border with Belarus, uh, crossing the border between Ukraine and Belarus, and then between Belarus and Ukraine, and then they are at work. So every day they would be crossing like four borders. Uh, but right now the situation is very complicated and uh, Chino, uh, Slavutich used to be under occupation. So we will have to create a new commutement route and it's not done yet. So the rotation is possible, but it's not uh, right now. It is not, you know, uh, perfect because commuting might take like up to six hours and their roads are uh, destroyed on the northern part of Ukraine. And you also saw probably reports from Bucha and Kostomil, and uh, it's a nightmare over there. So uh, it it is possible to retain the personnel, but it is very complicated. 
Okay, so by now it's 2.30, so I think we will stop here. So please, let me thank you again um, very much. And, and I see also in the public chat, there's many, many thanks for you. Uh, I would like to thank all, also the, the whole audience and of course, Babs and Kirsten for, for the technical organization. And so the, the recording, so the whole webinar is recorded and it will be available on the Eurodos YouTube channel in one of the next days. So just YouTube and then type in Eurodos and you should be able to find it. And of course, with, with many more questions uh, to Oliena or, um, or discussions about how we can help. So I think her email is also somewhere in the presentation and it can be distributed so uh, that we can stay in touch. So thank you very much. And... Um, and we'll keep in touch, okay? So okay. thanks everybody. Bye. Bye.